you go ask Holly? No, yeah. When I get my hair done, am I getting it dyed and done? No. It's just enough to. You didn't say anything about that. Oh, okay. Is your phone on silent for church? Okay. I always leave it on silent. Notifications scare me. Successful. Thank you. Do you want your coffee now or? Glad to have you back.
morning. You want to remember a couple of people. Lori Wells. Not looking good for Lori. And Phyllis Shelton had a stroke a couple of Sundays ago and she's recovering and rehab. And Joe Keeper had a stroke. And he's in the hospital recovering from that. You know, it's the time of year and the age we get, that's what happens. So we need to lift these people up in prayer. And maybe you have a special request this morning. And so uh, if you can uplift your hand and say, you know what, I, I need you to pray for this person or for me. Amen? Amen. Amen? So let's look to the Lord this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your graciousness and your goodness to us. And Lord, we thank you for the cross this morning and for the blood that was shed for each of us. And we can know without a shadow of a doubt it is well with our soul this morning. And so I pray, Father, if there's anybody here this morning that doesn't know for sure, before they leave the sanctuary, they can know for sure it is well. And Father, we lift these people up to you. We think of Lord and what he's going through. I just pray that you might minister to him today. Yes. And for Phyllis and for Joe with their stroke, I just pray, Father, that the nurses and doctors will prescribe the right medicine or the tools or the rehab for them so that they can recover 100%. And for those who have lifted their hands this morning, Lord, you know the need that they are expressing by this uplifted hand, whether it's for them or somebody else, that you might meet their need. And Lord, for this service, we just pray your cover. We pray for your presence. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come and minister to us through the word and through our pastor and through the music. And whatever is done, all that is said and done may bring glory to your name. For we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
um, right? You don't necessarily see the down moments or the difficult moments because you're seeing the highlights, right? Every week I get a new picture of the little baby who's going to be a year old on Monday. Right? 50 weeks, 51 weeks, 52 weeks as of Monday. Uh, uh, so I'm sure there's going to be a party, and I'm sure there's going to be lots of fun to be had. But, but we have to be careful that we don't, we don't look at the Facebook culture, the social media culture, and look at our own lives and get a skewed perspective on what life is really like in the real world. And so um, Genesis chapter 18 is where we're going to be. Uh, Luke 137 is mentioned there in your notes as well, where um, the angel speaks to Mary, and it is said, for nothing is impossible with God. <coughs> nothing is impossible. So turn your neighbor and tell them, nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. So in Genesis 18, with Abraham and Sarah, um, it is, it's a story that probably many of us have have read, heard, heard sermons on, studied, but we're going to read this today. Stand with me if you would for the reading of the word, if you're able to stand. Genesis 18, verses 9 through 15. These visitors are with Abraham, and they ask, Where is your wife Sarah? They asked him. There in the tent, he said. Then the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now, Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent. Now, yeah, I can imagine that right away. <laughs> Abraham's out talking to some people. She's over there listening, right? You don't do that in your house, do you? Mm -hmm. Somebody's having a conversation and you're eavesdropping. <laughs> so she's at the entrance of the tent. Abraham and Sarah were already old and well advanced in years, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed at herself, and that's interesting there. She laughed to herself. Um... Uh, laughed to herself, so she thought, as she thought, after I am worn out and my master is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I'll return to you at this appointed time next year and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, as she, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, yes, you did laugh. Father, I thank you today for your word. I pray, God, that uh, we would learn from uh, your word about Sarah and Abraham. I pray, God, that it would resonate with us and our spirits and our hearts today. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So Sarah laughs, but she laughs kind of to herself, right? Imagine if someone could overhear your thoughts. <laughs> right? That would be a dangerous thing. If we could overhear each other's thoughts. So she hears this about this child that she's going to have. And she has probably spent years longing to have a child. And longing for that, that benefit and that ability to have a, a child or to have a family beyond just her and Abraham. And so in this moment, right, this laughter is probably accompanied by quite a bit of pain. In terms of this journey that she has been on and the struggle that she has had. Uh, to do what families did and to be able uh, to have that family and to be the people that God wanted them to be. I think one of the th big things about Sarah that is, is, is the first thing that we ought to think about is that God knows your heart as well as your words, right? She laughed at her, to herself as she thought, after I am worn out, my master is old, will I have this pleasure? See, God, God knows everyone's heart. He knew Sarah's heart. He knew that for years she had been struggling with this, right? Anyone who has lived for some years on this earth, right? We have those things that have gone with us and, and painful moments and painful experiences that we have dealt with and that we have carried with us. And so God knows her heart, right? You might think, well, we better not laugh at God. Um, and that would uh, probably be wise counsel. That would be wise counsel. <laughs> Right? But Sarah, God, you know what? Here, here's the thing. God can handle my thoughts, my doubts, my questions, my concerns, my uh, wondering. Okay, God, why did you allow this to happen, God? But why did you allow that to happen? Right? I think I saw this morning there was another shooting in Texas or somewhere. Yeah. Like eight people killed. Like, God, why? And what is the point of this? And so God, you know, if you read the book of Job or you read other books throughout the Bible, uh, Paul in his, his, um, his thorn in the flesh, right? God allows certain things in this world. Job, who lost everything, and questioned God for 40-some chapters. 
35 to 40 chapters and questions God. He doesn't renounce his faith in God at any moment, but he says, God, I don't get this. Why am I going through this? And so the irony is that now that Sarah is older, I better, I better be careful when I talk about age, uh, that Sarah is older, that now, God, you are going to bless me with this. When I'm too old to keep up, or when I'm too old to handle this, Although we do pretty well with our grandkids, but then we take the grandkids and we send them back home. Do you, you get tired watching the kids or the grandkids? And you have them sometimes a little much, a little more than you can handle. You're like, I can do a little while, but I got a limit here <laughs> of what I can do. I love them like I love them like crazy, but there's only so much I can I can handle. God knows your heart, and then in verse 14. He says, is anything too hard for the Lord? Now think about that. Is anything too hard for God? No. no. Nothing is too hard for God. Nothing is impossible with God. And so uh, Sarah lies maybe first to herself and then lies to God. Um, she didn't do it out loud according to the text. She sort of did it to herself. He knows she laughed, and she's afraid, so she denies it. But I would imagine that underneath that laughter is a whole lot of pain and insecurity and struggle and grief over her journey and over the many years that she prayed for a child and she longed for a child and her desire to, to have a child with Abraham just went over and over and over again. So I imagine when, when she laughed, it was really to cover up something deeper, right? That... It's easy to laugh something off to give a signal to people around us, oh, well, I'm not really bothered by that. Do you do that? Right? Something really kind of cuts you to the core. Somebody says something or somebody does something. They probably didn't even know they did it. They didn't know they said it, but it kind of cuts deep. And it, it, I don't want to admit it, so I just kind of laugh about it, but I'm really hurting. Right? And so I have to be careful that I don't mask what's really going on with me by surface type attitudes and behavior. Well, that, now nah, that didn't really hurt. I'm laughing, but something is living with me on the inside and I'm not really comfortable with it, right? She responds by laughing at all, but she was probably hurt. She was probably grieved over this reality. But God can handle your grief. God can, can handle your heart. He can handle your strengths and weaknesses. God knows you, and he loves you, and he is with you, no matter what your response is in the moment. Romans 8, verse 26 and 27 says, In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints, in accordance with God's will. So the danger is that I might limit God with my emotions, my feelings. Do I continue to live as a person in, with faith regardless of what I am dealing with on the inside? There's a great quote that I read in the last few days again, that failure is an event. It is never a person. Failure is an event. It is never a person, right? So when we think about failure, we might think, I'm a failure. I feel like a failure. Wow, I really screwed this one up. That's why I call Dave Lyons. So I screw up things last, right? And so I feel, but you, regardless of what has happened in your life, it is not you that is a failure. If you feel that way, we all have had that emotion. I understand that it is an event. It is something that has happened, but it does not have to define who you are now or going forward. It doesn't have to. And you know what? The, God didn't give up on Sarah then. He didn't say, oh, you laugh, now you don't get a baby. <laughs> he didn't say, you laugh, so it's off now. Right? Because you laughed, no, God says even stronger, yes, I know you laughed, you lied about laughing, but I'm going to come back next year and you're going to have a baby. Right? So God overcame her laughter and her fear and continued to fulfill his promise regardless of the way she reacted in the moment. Right? So you know what? It's good news that God overcomes our, our disbelief or our struggle or our emotion or whatever it is that holds us back, that God can overcome that 
and help me to continue on even though I might have been struggling in the moment. He didn't give up on Sarah. He didn't say, uh, now you're going to remain childless. She went forward. She was not a failure. It was an event, but it was not who she was. Hindsight must become foresight. If you're following along in the notes, you can, you can see this here. Sarah said, this is chapter 21, jumping forward a little bit. God has brought me laughter, and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? I have borne him a son in his old age. And so, you know, there is a child here now, um, Isaac, although we know there was another child, Ishmael, along the way. And I can imagine little um, Isaac running around the house and getting into things and exhausting his mother and exhausting his father, right? Imagine two people around 100 years old chasing a toddler. <laughs> Some of you have pain in your joints just thinking about that, right? So people over 100 years old chasing around a toddler, and they're just laughing. God, what is this? <laughs> like, I'm too old for this. I used to say to my kids, you know, even when they were young, and uh, I, was, I was 29 when I got married, so hey, my kids were born when I was in my 30s, and I r routinely tell them, I'm old. You know, I'm old. And I, I milked that for as much as I could. <laughs> Um, hindsight, though, should become foresight. I, I used to tell my kids, and now the little kids that stay with us sometimes, I tell them my favorite game is the night night game. Yeah. I still tell her that, a little four year old. My favorite game, Uncle Mark, get up, let's do something, let's play a game, let's go. My favorite game is the night night game. Uh, I still tell them that. Hindsight must become foresight. Genesis chapter 21. That I have borne him a son in his old age, and there is a different kind of laughter now, the laughter of having a child running around and being a part of their lives, and the life that comes with having a child uh, in the home. And so Sarah says, so God has brought me laughter, and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. God is full of surprises, so I would, I would encourage you to not give up and don't quit. Hindsight can bring laughter, tears, it can bring growth, but at some point my hindsight should become foresight, right? The things that I've learned from the past, uh, my struggles, my events of failure, my challenges that I've had, right? At some point I should get better in terms of, okay, I can trust you, God, right? Because you did something that I thought wasn't going to happen, and so God, you did it, you gave me this child, so um, going forward I should be uh, ready and prepared to exhibit faith in whatever circumstance comes my way. And if God says that nothing is impossible with him, I maybe should believe that. Maybe I should actually live that way. By hindsight should become foresight, and your faith should be stronger and deeper um, because of these things that you've been through. And we should not make the same mistakes over and over and over again. Right? At some point, we should learn from our mistakes. And so this is one of the elements, if you're talking about success and failure, right? A person who is making the same uh, mistakes that they made five years ago or 10 years ago or 15 years ago, at some point, you're like, why aren't you learning from these things that you've been through? Right? I remember I was, I, I've done a lot of things that um, were mistakes or maybe I would view as failure at the time. I remember... I was painting a hallway in Wilmington where I pastored for 10 years. And I think we had repainted everything. We had a 75th anniversary celebration. And um, the wall started to look bad. It started to look scuffed. So I got out some paint. I'll just touch up these areas outside the bathrooms on one end and this end of the hallway. And so I painted it. And it didn't look quite right. And I thought, well, it's wet. So it's not the right color because it hasn't dried yet. And so I left it, it dried, I came back, and I said, that's still just not quite right. So I painted it again, right, or touched up again, or I don't remember how much of it I painted. But after two or three times, I finally realized there is something wrong here. And I had a paint that was not the same color as the paint that was on the wall. But I kept painting it over and over and over again, thinking that somehow that was going to change things. Right? And I finally realized the paints were very, very close in color. And one might have been the old color before you repainted everything, and one might have been the new color, right? And paint ages, it kind of changes over time and the scuffs, and so it can look different. 
Um, but, you know, if I keep painting with the same paint, I'm not learning my lesson from my previous, you know, goofiness. And so at some point, hindsight should become foresight. And, and that should become something that is a part of my spiritual journey. I should be learning from those things, not necessarily living in the past or living in something that I regret or something I did poorly, but I'm learning something so that I can go forward in my life and in my faith and not just sit stuck in the same place spinning my wheels over and over again. Hindsight should become foresight. Theodore Roosevelt said, the only man who never makes mistakes, uh, makes a mistake is the man who never does anything. Edison spent more than $100,000 to obtain 6,000 different fiber specimens, and only three of them provided satisfactory uh, working. Each failure, though, brought him that much closer to the solution to his problem. His friend Henry Ford was right when he said that failure was the opportunity to begin again more intelligently. So every day, I have the opportunity to begin again more intelligently. Every moment, every day, Every, every hour, um, every incident that happens, um, you can tell that to your neighbor, right? Every day is an important, this isn't a long one. To, to try again with more intelligence, that can be dangerous if you said that to your neighbor. I cannot let deep, deep detours derail my life. The challenge is that I um, allow the detours or the moments of struggle to define me, and I, I struggle, I sit still, I feel like I'm going backwards. Paul said this in Philippians 3, Brothers, I do not myself yet have to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, this too God will make clear to you basically says, right, if you're not there yet, God will make it clear to you at some point. And so I cannot allow detours to de derail my life. Right? Anybody ever taken some detours? And they took you a lot further off the road than you intended to go. And they took you down a path that was painful. I told you my story a few years ago about going through Tennessee and the traffic was backed up. Some of you were here for that, and I started to go off onto a side road, and I was following my app and what it was telling me, and so I'm going through hills and hollers, and I go, and at first, you know, it looked like a good road. Actually, I got off, and the road that the GPS was telling me to take was closed for some other reason, so I kept going and took another road, figuring, well, then I'll get, if I go south, eventually I'll get to where I need to be. So the road was paved for a while, and then the road was gravel, for a while and the road literally I felt like I was on somebody's farm with like a dirt road a little bit gravel and it's like getting smaller and smaller and smaller and I thought I'm gonna have to turn around and go all the way back and then wait in the traffic and do this finally I did actually break through and get around Knoxville um, I'm still thank you Jesus I'm not, still not sure how I did that but I cannot allow detours to de derail my life Paul says up until the end of his life, if you want to talk about the spiritual life, if you want to talk about following Jesus, if you want to talk about salvation, or if you want to talk about life with the Holy Spirit, sanctification, being transformed by Christ, even Paul the Apostle said, I'm not there yet. Paul said, I press on. I, I don't have it yet. I'm not there. I keep striving for Jesus every part of this life and every part of this journey. And no, until I die, I am going to be striving for something that I'm not saying I've laid hold of yet. One thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, right? He, he's doing one thing, forgetting what's behind and striving for what's ahead. Forgetting what's behind and striving for what's ahead. And Paul had some major challenges along his ministry in that part of the world as he ministered to churches and started churches and wrote letters to churches and tried to steer them in, in the direction that God would have them to go and that Paul would have them to go. And so what matters is not just beginning the race, what matters is finishing the race. Detours do not have to be the last word. No. If, I remember this analogy somebody shared with me many years ago. If I was going to get on the road and, and go on a trip, if I was going, you know, uh, somewhere to visit, maybe I'm going to Tennessee, like country boy here, Mike. I'm 
going to go to Tennessee? Well, he probably wants to go to the beach, so he's probably going further south, right? On to Florida yeah. somewhere. And if Mike and Judy get in the car and they go down the road, <clears throat> and, you know, Judy's offering, you know, uh, fun and laughter along the way, as she does, and they get a few hours down the road, and, um, you know, uh, they say, let's get off on this exit, let's get some gas, and, or let's get some food, and you go too far and you miss your, your exit. Well, I really wanted to go to that restaurant, and that was, you know, we're going to have another hour before we, before we get there. They pull up on this exit, and they, and they um, realize after a moment they were on the wrong one, and they said, someone said, oh, we got to go back home now. We've got to go back to Ohio. It's Judy's fault. It's Mike's fault, right? If it were in my car, it would be my fault, right? And we got to go home now because we got up on the wrong exit. No, that's not what you do. You get back on the road and you keep going. Don't you? And you listen to your wife and everything she says. Right? You get back on the road and you keep going toward your destination. The detour is not, doesn't have to kill your trip. Right. The detour doesn't have to define you, right? It's something you can laugh about, hopefully. It's something that you remember. It's something that, you know, is there, but you put it behind you and you keep going forward. And that is one of the challenges, I think, that many of us, when it comes to what is success and what is failure, um, I got to understand that we all have some of those detours that we're, we put in our rearview mirror and we keep going. So in your spiritual life, you've got to ask this question. Am I allowing the detour to define me, or am I allowing the struggle uh, to keep me uh, held in bondage over something from the past, or something uh, that happened, or something that is extremely painful? And you know what? Sarah still had the, the baby, right? God visited her, and she uh, was able to conceive, and Isaac, right, the, the, the chain of our ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, but down. Because God was faithful to his word over her laughter. And maybe God, um, I don't know what make God what makes God chuckle. I don't know what makes makes God, you know, think. I know he is pleased with us as we follow him, and he's pleased with us, although we do um, we do struggle sometimes. I wonder if God laughed a little bit when Sarah laughed. I don't think of God usually in that way, but he knows us. Right? He knows our hearts. He knows who we are. And he probably is saying, you know what? Oh, you know, she laughed, but let's move on. David, you know, it's amazing that David is so prominent in the history of Israel with some of the mistakes he made. It is amazing that David is held in such honor when David did some of the most horrific things that we read of in the scripture. It, 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 with, with Peter and denying Jesus, with Thomas and doubting Jesus with Judas betraying Jesus, right? It, it is uh, hard to imagine that, that these people, not Judas necessarily, but the others, uh, ended up in a place where they served God faithfully. And so we are finishing the race, and we are putting things behind us and looking ahead. There's a little thing I wanted to read to you. It's on your notes. Um, I think it's on the back side from Max Lucado. When he says, is anything too hard for the Lord? The answer is no. The God of surprises strikes again. God does that for the faithful. Just when the womb gets too old for baby, Sarah gets pregnant. Just when the failure is too great for grace, David is pardoned. The lesson, three words, don't give up. Is the road long? Don't stop. Is the night black? Don't quit. God is watching. For all you know, right at this moment, the check may be in the mail. The apology may be in the making. The job contract may be on the desk. Don't quit, for if you do, you may, be, you may miss the answer to your prayers. You never know what God is doing, right? You never know what God is planning, what God has for us. We know that it's good, but if I quit and if I go backwards, I, I am not living in that forward motion of God's desire for us. So we're going to take communion today. Um, the worship team is going to come and going to lead us in a song. And over on either side of the altar, <clears throat> we have communion elements. Um, and I want to invite you to the table of the Lord today. And when we come to the table, we do it in response to the grace that has been given us through Jesus, through his body, which is broken for us, through his blood, which is shed for us.
And so what I think is so powerful about coming to the table is I can come to the table as I am. God, here I am today. Here's, here's what I'm dealing with. Here's what's going well. Here's what I'm struggling with. I may be on, at the highest of highs and I could be at the lowest of lows, but I come to the table in response to the prompting of your spirit. And God, whatever it is that you want to do in me today, I invite you to do that. So in a moment as we sing, you can come up and take the elements. You can kneel at an altar if you would like to take the elements. You can take them back to your seat. I invite you to use this moment as a response to the God who has created you and loves you and says, you're doing well. Keep going. You're, 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 you've had, we've all had some struggles in the past. Keep going. Keep your eyes on me and keep moving. Because I love you and I am with you. And the God is encouraging us. He is propelling us forward. And so let me pray for us uh, as we begin to come. Father, I pray for this moment as we come and take the elements. Father, I pray that we would respond to your love and your grace and your mercy, which has been given for us. I pray, Father, that if there's something that we need to put in our rearview mirror, something we need to put behind us, help us to do that and to be honest about it and say, you know what, God? I'm not proud of this. This really wasn't what I intended, but um, this has to go behind me so that I can, I can move forward, as Paul said, right? Forgetting the things that are behind and straining towards what is ahead, and we strive for that, to follow you with all of our hearts, Jesus. And so I pray that you bless these elements um, as they symbolize and they embody your blood, body, which was uh, broken for us, and your blood, which was shed for us. And I pray that this moment would be a, a moment of response to you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may begin to come.
for your mercy, for your kindness, for your patience with us. I thank you that you uh, minister to Sarah and you can handle uh, her laughter. You can handle her struggle. You can handle her pain. You can handle, um, you know, her, her questions about her situation and why she has gone so long without having uh, the, the blessing of a child. We thank you that you, you continue to fulfill your promise to her regardless of how she responded. We thank you for that today. We thank you for your body, which was broken for us, and your blood, which was shed for us. We do not take those lightly, and I pray, God, that that this response that we have would be transformative for us, that we would go from this place thinking about how we can uh, closely follow you. And we thank you today in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So may the God who allowed Sarah to laugh, David to wander, Peter to deny, and Thomas to doubt, and still use them, go with us now. Amen. We have one more song if you want to join in with us.